Born in Cleveland, raised a hillbilly. What's your story? Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Here's your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. Welcome back to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. The chapter that I'll read for today's podcast is called All of Our Cars Were Brown and Old. We had so many vehicles growing up. I'm sure you can guess by now that it wasn't because we were wealthy. It was because all these crappy old vehicles were always breaking down. Until I was about nine years old, our cars were of various colors, usually green or white. But later, mom and dad developed an unwavering loyalty to the color brown. And regardless of the color, they were always old. Mom and Dad and George and I moved to Arkansas in the green truck, as George and I called it, with whatever worldly possessions fit with us. The green truck was a 1965 International Harvester Travel All, which was an old-school SUV. The green truck was green, and it became someone's house when Dad sold it. Of course, we also had the 1965 Volkswagen Bonfire, I mean Beetle, It was white slash charcoal. For a brief time, we had a totally pimped out forest green Cadillac with power door locks and windows and adjustable seats and food trays in the back. Someone that dad worked with at Campbell's Soup used to live in this Cadillac in the Campbell's Soup parking lot. The guy eventually got an apartment and sold his house to dad. Before long, the power seat on the driver's side got stuck in the low position where dad would set it. Mom had to sit on three pillows just to see out the windshield to drive. Then there was a 1962 red, white, and primer-colored International Harvester Scout. It was a four-wheel drive recreational vehicle made to compete with the Jeep. It was great for the dirt road mountain, but it was never really meant for highway driving. We drove it to Ohio and back one year visiting relatives. Dad didn't seem to mind driving all these cars, but they were nearly the end of my mom. One day, Mom went to start the Scout after she got out of nursing classes at the University of Arkansas, and the carburetor caught on fire. This was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Mom walked to Jose's Mexican Restaurant and Cantina on Dixon Street, plopped down on a bar stool, ordered a shot and a beer, and bummed a cigarette. She didn't smoke. She called Dad from the restaurant phone and told him that he had to come pick her up because she was having a nervous breakdown. The scout was towed to the bottom of our driveway where it sat for a couple of years. One day, Mr. Emerson asked Dad if he'd sold the scout because he'd seen it hitched up to the back of a tow truck heading into Fayetteville. Dad hadn't sold it, and we never found out what happened to it. Someone almost certainly sold it to a salvage yard and probably got a couple hundred dollars out of it for scrap metal. Flash forward to the brown car years. We had a huge brown Chevy pickup truck with a four-speed transmission plus a granny gear. Probably another one that should have never left the dirt roads, but did. It had no power steering, and Mom had to rise up and stand on the clutch with both feet to shift it while driving. We also had a brown Plymouth Fury, which Mom deemed the ugliest car she'd ever seen in her life. Quite an award considering all the other cars we'd own. The vinyl top was all cracked and peeling on the outside of the car, and the fabric on the ceiling of the interior was all shredded. It dangled down like brown, poop-colored Christmas tinsel, and we were continually wiping it out of our faces and ripping pieces off. Sadly for Mom, the Fury was not only the ugliest car we ever had, but also the best running car we ever had. It just would not die. Mom finally declared that she was going to set a fire beneath it to end her misery, so Dad gave it away. At one point, both of our running family vehicles were brown station wagons. When we were getting ready to go somewhere, all of us kids would always place bets. Are we going to take the brown station wagon with wood paneling or the brown station wagon without wood paneling? We weren't rooting for either one in particular. I'd like to welcome back our discussion panel members for today's podcast. 
So if you could just give, they're going to give a six word summary. And if you are interested in hearing more expanded background on the panel members, then you can hear that in the previous podcast. Hi, I'm Laura, and I am the Energizer Bunny um, chef instructor and perpetual student. Hi, this is uh, Cynthia Kramer. I am the ma mother, bassoonist, and environmentalist. Hey, thank you very much for joining us again. So in this chapter, um, there's some a, a couple of places where people were using vehicles actually as houses. So uh, my dad sold the green truck and that became someone's house. It was actually a pretty spacious green truck. So, you know, this, this person kind of had a luxurious car house. Um, and then there was the, the Cadillac that had the food trays and, you know, all of the, the kind of all of the bu buzzers and bells. Um, and that was somebody's house that lived in the Camel Soup parking lot. So, um, and, and this is not the only, you know, time that we see this. There's a, even some more stories such as this um, later on. So this was actually pretty typical for Cove Creek, Arkansas, and probably still today is a little bit typical for Cove Creek, Arkansas. Um, but I'm curious for um, those of you on the panel, you're not from Arkansas, um, do you know anyone who lived out of his or her car or maybe another kind of alternative dwelling besides the house? Okay, well, well, I'll start. Um, well, I'm from the suburbs of Chicago and everyone I know has a place to live or a friend or family member that would let them stay with them. Um, later on, I got more involved in the local music scene in Chicago, and I'd come across some some colorful characters that would share with me what they would do to kind of survive. You know, they couldn't afford rent, so they'd either, you know, bum with someone for a month, or they would live out of their car, or they'd do a combination of... So, um, no one really close to me, but definitely if you go into the artist world, you're going to you're gonna find that type of thing's going to show up here. Okay. Yeah. I had a college friend who um, actually was in between college and, and coming home from the service, and he had this tiny Ford Escort. Now, you have to imagine this guy is about, oh, I would say 6'2", and pretty lanky, but he would live in this Ford Escort for about a month because then he'd have to return back to do his um, reserve time. So he was in between um, college and, and, you know, he really didn't have a place to live because he was back and forth. And uh, I just remember him putting the seats down flat and trying to stretch out so his feet would touch the gas pedal and his head would touch the back of the back of the car. But he would park in a cemetery because oh he didn't think anyone would bother him. And I just could never get over that, that he would live in the cemetery at night, get up first thing in the morning, go to work, and then, you know, it was lights out when, when it got dark and he would eat on, on the base and that's where he would sleep every night. For a month, he did that. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how he could do it. I could never live in a, or in a sleep cemetery. in a cemetery. So I guess no one bothered him. It was quiet. Yeah. It was I, very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no one kicked him out. Like the undertaker wasn't coming by, I no. guess. And he parked in the, you know, in the trees and he said no one ever bothered him. He never got scared. So... Huh. It sounds like an ideal situation. <laughs> yeah, why am I not him. doing that? <laughs> Work okay. for him. Hey, it was cheap. What can I say? <laughs> so um, along these lines, um, we had the ugliest car award that my mom was giving out to our Plymouth Fury. It really, it really was ugly, actually. Um, but a lot of them were. Um, so I'm wondering if you ever had a vehicle growing up that could have won such an award or maybe a different kind of award, and what would that be? Oh, my goodness. I think everyone has an ugly car. <laughs> ugly car award. My ugly car um, is awarded to my purple 
blue gremlin that I had. Wow. (laughs) That shows my years, doesn't it? But it gets even better because it had orange tires and it had windows, the two back windows that would not roll down. So every time we had to open the window, we'd have to have one person with the crank and the other person holding window the window on both sides to push it up. And uh, we traveled all over southern Indiana in that car. And we had a great time in it, but it was definitely the ugliest car I've ever had. <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> Hands down, the all-time winner. So where did all of these orange and all these colors come from? Your parents bought it that way? Or? Yes, we okay. bought it. It was the first car. And so we just, I was happy to have a car. It got me from A to B, so I was a happy girl. Okay. How about you? <laughs> Cynthia? Well, I'm just so impressed that it was a gremlin purple and had colored <laughs> tires. Mine mine is ugly and it kind of just falls in, but it's kind of like an ugly that you could love, maybe. Oh, I didn't have those. Um, <laughs> well, no, but it's, it's, it's similar to yours. So uh, we had a Buick station wagon and um, we really liked it, but the engine died out of it. So my parents replaced it with a diesel truck engine. So my mom would come to pick me up from friends' houses, and you could hear her coming down the street because it was like a truck was coming to pick me up. They'd be like, Cynthia's mom's here. Oh. And then I guess I was supposed to be embarrassed, but I I thought that, you know, you could get a you could get a station wagon as either either a diesel or regular. Like it didn't occur to me that most cars, you know, took regular fuel. I just thought, oh well, ours is just a diesel. This is normal. And then um, what I really liked was, you know, if my mom would get mad at someone, if they were tailgating or something, she would just gun it. And then they would be left in this cloud of black smoke. (laughs) It was just, to me, so it really had some charm. And, like, I remember we got some gum stuck on, like, the cloth seat or whatever. And it lasted a long time. And it was just the station wagon, you know. And we, we liked it. They probably got it new, but I only remember it as old. Right. <laughs> now, this kind of a theme keeps coming back to in these is that when you're a kid, you don't realize usually, um, you know, how embarrassing something <laughs> should have been, I guess, <laughs> is what I could say about right? that. Right. Everyone would be like, oh, Cynthia, your mom's car. And I just didn't. It didn't click with me. I was like, oh, no, that's just the station wagon. It takes diesel. It makes a lot of noise. <laughs> the boys would think it's pretty cool. It makes some great sounds. Oh, yeah. They'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, Cynthia's mom's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had good pickup, I think. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> okay. So um, ne- next, moving on. Um, so my mom really has a lot of patience still to this day, but there was a time that she just reached her limit and had this kind of nervous breakdown. And, you know, it wasn't anything really unusual that the carburetor would catch on fire, at least for us, but it was just kind of the the proverbial straw that that broke the camel's back. So, um, describe a time when one of your parents or another family member maybe just reached their limit or nearly so. And, um, you know, what do you remember about that kind of a situation? Okay. Well, lucky for me, you know, my parents are traditional Polish American Catholic and uh, they don't reach limits. <laughs> so, um, they always seem to come through when the unexpected would happen. So we used to live in the country, as in houses eventually got built up around us, but there was a horse stable across the street, and there was a hay barn, and there was some spontaneous combustion in the hay barn, and the hay barn caught fire. But it's just across the street. So it's the middle of the night. You can see these flames. I'm, like, watching out of my window, and my dad is outside hosing down our roof so that as the ashes come down that our house doesn't catch on fire okay and that's what all night is going on and you know it's my dad my dad's cool i know we can save our house 
I thought I wasn't really scared. In the morning, all I could remember is I went outside and I had this like yellow slip and slide. It had all these ashes in it. That's all I could remember. I just remember looking at the barn that was now a just black thing and ashes in my slip and slide. But our house was saved. So... So it didn't seem to be too stressful, but it was. Just... It, I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were very really stressed. But for me, let's say I'm seven years old. Again, your concept of stress just isn't the same. Right. You didn't hear yelling and screaming. So. Oh, I'm sure yeah. there was. I'm sure. I'm sure across the street there was. Or like, the barn's on fire. You know, fire is fire. Everybody screams fire when that happens. <laughs> Okay, so your parents kept it together. Yeah. How about you, Laura? Mine are pretty similar. Well, my I would have to go back to my dad. Um, grew up in a family, you know, Mexican Italian family. So you think these they're really feisty people, and so some of them were. But my dad was pretty cool, calm, and collected. And uh, I can remember the one one time when my grandmother, um, you know, with thirteen children, and you know. Eight of them are boys, and so they got into a bit of mischief and uh, would pull pranks on one another, but she actually got very upset with my uncle. I don't know what he did, but I do know what ended up is he was in a pink dress standing on the porch for about half, you know, about a half an hour. That's what she did. She put him in the pink dress and made him stand <laughs> in the front porch in front of all of the neighbors. And my brother, my father told me that all the brothers would go back and forth taunting him. <laughs> and that was his punishment because she had said, that's it. I've had it. Had enough. So. That's a new one. That's a new I one. I haven't tried that when I've been in an argument with my husband. My so. poor uncle. <laughs> Has he recovered from this? <laughs> he's a great storyteller and he's a jokester, so maybe oh, that had something to do with it. Maybe he enjoyed, maybe he secretly enjoyed all the attention. I don't know. Are but... there photos? No. <laughs> Just, it's ingrained in our memories, though. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And you, you, you saw it? I, well, you heard my, about it? my father told me. Okay, you heard it. They had many stories to tell, but this was, this was a good one. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> How he would let that kind of come about, I would like to have known a little more about. I don't think he was a little afraid of his mother. You know? Okay. She was, this, she was this Italian woman, and boy, she, you know, her word was the Bible. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we had really yearly vacations to Ohio when I was growing up, from Arkansas to Ohio, and... That was pretty much what we did, and I know that that's typical also for for a lot of families. You know, I talk to other people, and they're like, "Well, we'd really like to go out west, but oh wait, we have you know my mom and dad are in this other state, and they're going to be totally offended if we don't go and spend our vacation there." Um, so I'm just wondering, did your family have a yearly vacation destination, and then? Um, describe a time when you went on a vacation that was maybe different from the norm. Um, so I remember very distinctly a vacation to Florida when I was pretty young, and that really, really sticks in my mind because it was different. We always went to Ohio, and um, this time we went to Florida. So um, how did your vacationing go when you were growing up? Well, I can start. Um... So uh, my family is originally from the St. Louis area, and then um, my one of my mom's brothers uh, played football at Southeast Missouri, and he stayed out there in Cape Girardeau. And he had originally a trailer at Kentucky Lake. So he had a home, but then he had this trailer at Kentucky Lake. And that was super fun. They had a speedboat. You know, we were, again, young. Maybe maybe I was like 12 and my sister was 10 and then our older cousin was 14, but he would like drive the golf cart around. Um, and we'd go around 4th of July like, and we would go out on the boat. I think one time we were out for the fireworks and the boat died on the water and my grandma, you know, his mom was really upset, you know, because we're like all on this boat. We don't know. How, it's dark. We don't know how we're going to get back. 
but we would go there every year and um again it was just tons of fun because we didn't have a boat so it was always like oh let's go to uncle tom's he has a boat and we'll fish and grill out and uh and eventually now he has like a super nice lake house there so like over time you know he kind of built up what he did but i just have tons of fun memories and then he also let us be adventurous my parents were kind of sheltering but he let me do whatever i wanted you, you know to drive the boat so i didn't drive the boat but i did get to go tubing and skiing and they'd pretend to be fish to eat me while i was swimming and things like that <laughs> yeah okay now that sounds like fun yeah, we had um, we had a pretty adventurous group. Uh, we would travel to all parts of the states. My dad always loved to go out west. But one of my favorite um, trips was our Adirondack trip. And um, we never had anything set, no reservations at a hotel, nothing, nothing planned. We did this one time. And um, we were all excited because we had these visions of this pine ca log cabin in the woods with the lake. And it sounded so picturesque in the brochure. And we got there. And I will tell you, it was the nastiest hotel room I've ever seen in my entire life. We did not sleep on the beds because we they were, I think they were basically the spring mattress. And um, so we checked in very late and we were out by I think the crack of dawn the next morning and went on our merry way and found ourselves in Saranac Lake and if you've ever been in the Adirondacks this is just a beautiful little town nestled within the mountains and we found an amazing cabin slash boathouse and we walked in and it was exactly what I thought it would it was this beautiful um the whole picture window overlooked the sunrise and and it was right across the lake and so everything was magical that that summer and we stayed and boated and fished and hiked and it was just beautiful it sounds beautiful it was i've never been there oh yeah. gorgeous but these windy roads through the Adirondacks to get to it and we had no idea where we were going so we just said oh that looks nice and we just happened to drive off one side of the road and there it was. So were your parents pretty spontaneous or this was a different kind of a No, thing? they were spontaneous. Yeah. They were this was the one time when they actually had a reservation and didn't work out. So oh, okay. <laughs> so, I so, thought they were like cruising along and no, and no. then and then there's like, oh this is all we got. Turned out to be better to cruise along, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, so those were kind of typical destination spots. And what about then, did you guys ever have any kind of a different vacation, like my Florida vacation that was that sticks out in your memory? I do, I had a great vacation. So um, in 1991, um, my grandpa, who was a B-24 bomber pilot in the Pacific front of World War II, he took us to Hawaii to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Because at the end of his duty, um, his other bombardment group was disbanded, I think due to lack of members. And he was assigned to the 11th bombardment group, the Grey Geese. And he was not present on Hickam Field on December 7th, but they were. So, um, so they had all these ceremonies and bands. And this was, you know, it was a, it was a very important time of grandpa's life you know world war ii so he took his family so my sister my mom my dad me and my grandma we all got to go to hawaii oh wow! you know so going from like you know kentucky lake where you drive there to hawaii and i mean it was just magical you know and then it was it was extra special because everywhere along the way grandpa would say oh, and this is the Royal Hawaiian, and I would be here for R&R. &R. And then there were all these um, ceremonies, and we'd go to the Punch Bowl where they have all the um, the military cemetery. Um, and so you could have, like, the Star Spangled ba Banner playing in the background and a mosaic of Iwo Jima, and Grandpa's explaining what he did. And I don't know, it was just really moving and very, very fun. I mean, I, I actually got to take off from... Uh, middle school to go and then I came back and gave a presentation talk 
that's kind of, you know, that's kind of how they were. They're like, well, you can go if you make it educational. <laughs> um, and, you know, what's even cooler is I know if they do this, they'll have a time capsule with my name in it. So for the 100th anniversary, I can go back. Oh, okay. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So what did you put in the time capsule? I think just it's just, list I think it's names, just the names. Okay. But luckily with the internet and stuff, should be pretty easy to track down. Yeah, oh, that is interesting. I would love to go to Hawaii. Oh, I, it was it was everything I thought. You know, it was like just a whole new world. I mean, lush and and we and Grandpa did all this. Just, you know, he'd been there several times. So, you know, we did the Polynesian Cultural Center with the shows and the luau and museums and the Big Island with the volcanoes and everything. I bet yeah. it was neat to be with him when he was reliving. Mm -hmm. A lot of because this was the good. See, Hawaii was the good part. See, war is not mm -hmm. good, but Hawaii was when you were like recuperating. So he had a lot of good memories there. Yeah, oh, very neat. <laughs> yeah, that's great. He could share that with you. I know it just mm -hmm. it just really brings it brings things kind of as a good closure. It's a nice memory to have. Mm -hmm. yep. Did you have Beautiful. any kind of exceptional vacations, Laura? This is terrible. Nothing stands out in my head. We, um, like I said earlier, we, we've traveled on from coast to coast, I think. We've been to pretty much all the states. But, uh, yeah, I, I can't think of one that really stands out. They were all unforgettable experiences, all of them. And they were all different for you. And they there were all wasn't different. A, there wasn't right. a set destination. Mm -mm. Okay. So um, is there anything else that you guys would like to say final comments maybe for before we wrap this podcast up well i think it's just important i like to think about creative cars you know and <laughs> you know i you can all think of like you know the fun cars your friends had in high school or people that restore cars and kind of the the culture that goes around that you know i think that's pretty cool and then also what happens when you reach your limit you know, what is it that makes you reach your limit and how do you cope with that? So for us, for Laura and me, it seems like our parents really tried not to show us that they've reached the limit. So I don't know. That's kind of my summary of this <laughs> session. Thank you. I would encourage encourage um, pe more people to get out and share those experiences with their families too because sometimes it's good just to put everything away and just go just to have that moment in time where you're sharing that um destination with them versus you know we're, we're we all get so caught up in in the technology and and we're all so busy in our daily lives it's kind of nice to just let everything go and just spend that time with with your family right okay well, thank you once again. Thank you very much um, you. for joining us today. Um, so then next week, please tune in. And we we couldn't fit all of these ugly car stories into <laughs> one chapter <laughs> because there were numerous, numerous ugly cars. And so tune in next week when we'll continue with more car stories. Until then, dream big and have fun. <laughs> <laughs>